Good morning, friends. Right off the bat, before we get into the research articles, as we see there, we're going to be using the outbreak info in reference to looking at the claims in reference to a large aspect of our media friends to the disaster happening in Arkansas. A lot of you may have seen the 200% rise, so on and so forth, where our job is to fact check them. So let us begin as follows. We're using outbreak.info, there is our basically our variance. But the true outcome of what is occurring is as follows, and you draw your own conclusion. This is the mortality in reference to Arkansas. We compare all of our states together. And so make sure we are on the right one. Yep, that is new deaths per 100,000. And so if we go back down and we review our information in reference to cases, how does that compare to the other states? Please forgive me if I'm speaking kind of fast, but there we are right there. So that is their 200% rise, and that is what they are utilizing in the media to um, create a little bit of a stir. Again, draw your own conclusions. All right. Good morning to our data analysts, data scientists, uh, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, and all friends alike, which have a data-oriented, uh, how would you say, perception in reference to the ongoing pandemic policy or event. We'll just call it that. All right, and let's look at our, the data we're going to be covering right off the bat. But also, too, before we begin, uh, a lot of you may be short on time. You're looking for the VAERS, the Vaccine Events Report information, and that's what we're looking at right now. So if you need to move on, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we're at 397,441 reports of vaccine adverse event reactions since the beginning of January 2021. And of course, compared with all of 2020, that is 57,115 versus 397,441 vaccine adverse event reports. Again, I'm just not going to embellish the information as you see there uh, or add any emotional bias to it. So please draw your own conclusion in reference to that. First, for the fact checkers. What we're doing here is we're determining the amount of uh, adverse event reaction reports. We are taking the length of this, the, I should say the VAERS IDs. We are removing all the duplicates that can be the quite a few and then determining the length of the database to reference the remaining VAERS IDs. And we are coming up with this data right there. Again, a little technical for those that are not familiar with the data analytics, reference to Python. Also, to the data sources as follows are our wonderful friends at Outbreak.info. Great site overall. We are taking our various data sets from obviously the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. The database as follows is at 263.95 megabytes. Compare that to all of uh, basically 2020. And that was only 41 megabytes compared to 2021 with 263. We'll just say 264. We won't be scientific. We'll just be approximate uh, megabytes. So you can determine how the ratio of uh, adverse event reports compared to the prior year. We're using our wonderful friends at Our World and Data to do a great job. I always recommend if you want to need to any current information on the coronavirus pandemic, they have a wonderful data set. And... That's pretty much it for tonight. The studies that we'll be reviewing are as follows. Myocarditis following immunization. Again, there's two studies that came out with that real, uh, real um, how would you say, almost, the, they came out at the exact same time. Case reports on thrombocytopenia and thrombosis now being uh, the events happening in one individual simultaneously. Blood clots related to the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. Again, for those in, individuals not familiar, uh, there is obviously a little selection bias into the research articles that we are choosing, but that selection bias we find vital uh, in order to basically raise questions, not fear, but questions that need to be addressed. Otherwise, the anchor bias a reference to vaccines being 100% safe and so on and so forth can be very, very uh, hazardous and not advantageous for the public. Next, vaccines grown in eggs. We'll get to the conclusion, how the, basically the relationship of how that evolves what we're doing right now. 
uh, induce antibody response against egg-associated glycans. That was just discovered today. And how long has the flu vaccine been around? Think about that. New technology detects greater variety of T cells that respond to coronaviruses. Some really good information we'll pull from there. Uh, study with healthcare workers supports that immunity to SARS-CoV-2 is long lasting, a lot longer lasting than we were originally led on to believe. Uh, well, this is going to talk about the common cold in COVID-19, which many of your gut instincts were probably very much correct in the very beginning. And a fun one, liquid chalk. Yes, gym chalk. Another one that is very effective in combating the SARS-CoV-2 and influenza A viruses. All right, let us begin with the first research as follows. All right. Well, first off, let me respond to a question that was in the beginning in reference to vaccines that can basically um, influence mood. And I, I mentioned this before, and I'll allude to the data from the research that we utilize for that. We took research from the cytokines depression due to general medical uh, condition and antidepressant drugs. What a lot of people do not recognize is that sometimes in order to induce depression, yes, human experimentation, that is correct. Uh, what they utilize right here, if you read, uh, the particular vulnerability of low socioeconomic subjects to immunization induced depression is consistent with previous epidemiological studies demonstrated that people of low economic spectrum, we'll just say, have higher rates of major as well as chronic recurrent depression. All right, what they utilized here, and we have to see how this plays out with the new vaccines as well, is the hypothesis that they were uh, alluding to, uh, for example, subjects where teenager girls were vaccinated with live attenuated rubella virus. Based analysis levels of antibodies rubella, subjects were divided into groups, da 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 and They've basically found out subjects into their own baseline subjects from low socioeconomic status within the experimental group exhibited more severe depressed mood. And here's the data as follows. And they, you know, are, is the current uh, spectrum of vaccines likely of changing or altering behavior? Now, in this case, the study only went 10 weeks and it ended, so we don't know exactly uh, we don't have what we call right sensor data because we don't have we don't have an, an uh, I mean if 10 weeks was the end that's fine but we don't know for example the experimental group which was vaccinated how long they were depressed after the vaccine because it doesn't look like it went down it kind of looks like it went up and so yeah so basically if you want to go to a study in reference to how vaccines can alter mood uh, in reference to inflammatory compounds they produce uh, for example, thus even a mild viral infection can produce prolonged increase in depressive symptomology in vulnerable individuals. Uh, then this is the research that you want to look at. All right, now let's get into the research as follows. That's current. I wanted to cover that first because I promised I would. So here we go. Myocarditis following immunization with mRNA COVID-19 vaccines and members of the U.S. military. They really, really just basically rolled right over this one. It was like almost mentioned in the news and they just faded away. Again, it's an anchor bias that's generally could be exuded in the media. Uh, and obviously, too, it, it tends to be ignored because the high levels of what was called uh, virtue signaling, which is which is consistent regardless of political affiliation, ironically. So should myocarditis be considered a potential adverse event following immunization with messenger RNA COVID-19 vaccines? And the conclusion was as follows. In this case series, myocarditis occurred in previously healthy military patients with similar clinical presentations following a receipt of the mRNA vaccine. Further surveillance and evaluation of this adverse event following immunization is warranted. So what they're saying basically uh, is we really weren't looking at it, but it's now occurring and we need to stress to the medical professionals that we really need to start paying attention to this potential adverse event uh, effect. Now, obviously at this point in time, they're using as a general population and saying, well, uh, myocarditis is beginning to occur at a little bit higher level than would normally happen in an environment, uh, regardless of whether the person was vaccinated or not, but it's growing. And again, it just goes into the, basically the aspect that there, this is an experiment and they don't know all the potential outcomes. And so 
they don't want to scare people into not being vaccinated at the same time. But however, though, this is a seed which has been planted and may grow, may grow. Cardiac symptoms resolved within a week for onset of 16 patients. Seven patients continue to have chest discomfort at the time of this report. Follow-up is ongoing. The interesting part about this and kind of the sad part at the exact same time is normally most cases of myocarditis resolve themselves. In this case, we're taking young, healthy individuals, and even though the small group, it has not. And so you go on further, notably nearly 1% of highly fit athletes with mild COVID-19 have incidents of myocarditis. And I looked at that, it's more like 0.6. And so, yeah, you want to round up, that's possible, but you know, there's small groups. So, but I wanted to bring that attention out as well in fairness to the researchers, because I want to continue to the research. I don't want them to be af afraid of publishing research. Here we go again. Patients with acute myocarditis following mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, not the same study. All right, so here we go again. Uh, they found out obviously more people had myocarditis. Vaccine-associated myocarditis is, is an unusual entity that has been described for the smallpox vaccine. But here's the here is the caveat, which is quite interesting. But otherwise, only anecdotal cases reports have been described for other vaccines. It says among the 416,629 adults receiving live measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, or, or polio, or yellow fever, 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 viral vaccinations in the vaccine safety data link, there were no patients with myocarditis in the 42 days following vaccination. Now, this is important as far as drawing a correlation whether this is a common occurrence among vaccines. Now, the researchers point out at least the ones that they looked at, myocarditis does not normally appear, except in this new string of vaccines, which really, which is most interesting. Now, again, there could be conf there could be confounding factors. There could be selection bias. There could be other aspects in reference to things we're not thinking about that could be a contributing factor. But this particular group of vaccines seems to have a really weird effect on the blood, would be blood clots, uh, inflammation, we'll call it circulatory disorders. All right, as well, all four had received the second dose of the messenger RNA vaccine. They received Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, and so basically just it's 50-50 shot. Additionally, whether patients who experience acute myocard myocarditis following COVID-19 vaccine should receive subsequent booster vaccinations for COVID-19 variants or annual vaccinations for prophylactics if needed is an open question. So basically, if a person's already, so what they're implying is, you know, how rah-rah can you be on these vaccines in reference to individuals which are young, which are experiencing myocarditis, uh, should they continue getting uh, going through this myocarditis uh, uh, risk every single time they get vaccinated? You know, that's again, that's obviously I'm not going to I'm not going to make my judgment on that. That's for you and other policymakers to decide. All right, next after this, single case reports of thr thrombocytopenia and thrombosis syndrome. Uh, Basically, this is just something to keep an eye out. It is just begun. And so we're going to kind of skip over this article and I have the links for it at the same time. But this is like really, really hard hitting. Uh, but it's extremely rare. However, though, once something is seen, then others start to look for it. And that can create more biases over diagnosis and so on and so forth. I know that. But however, though, we know it's a potential. And here we begin. And so let's go to the next article. Blood clots related to the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. Again, this is not just to be negative. I like to purport more on the positives in reference to treatment of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. But however, though, this is just how the news landed on the table this week. It was all stuff in reference to 
uh, vaccine safety is what we'll, what, the way we'll word it. Quote, the risk of developing blood clot from vaccine is still far lower than the risk of developing clots from COVID-19, but it's imperative that clinicians are vigilant in detecting symptoms among vaccinated patients. Our, quoting, our research has shown that current guidelines lack the sensitivity to detect early cases of vaccine-induced clotting, and which could risk mis missing or delaying diagnosis. So basically, we revert back to sentence one. And so basically, yes, at this current juncture in detection, it is less than looking at COVID-19 itself. So what they're implying is, all right, this is a possibility. It's occurring. Let's start looking at it. As our understanding of this novel condition involves heightening our clinical awareness can improve outcomes for patients through early testing and treatment. So now what ends up happening is you start taking all these potential negative outcomes or adverse event reports that are now being validated and you start adding them up. And that is what helps you develop your risk to benefit ratio. What you'll see a lot of the news is they'll isolate it. They'll say, well, your chance of developing blood clots from this is less than the general and the chance of uh, developing thrombosis or thrombocytopenia or paralysis, or whatever it is. But when you add up all those conditions, now you can really get a good gauge and also too, whether the vaccine is that effective into the risk benefit analysis. But you can't say these, you know, you can't just pick one thing and say, oh, the risk is low compared to the benefit. No, you got to add them all up to proceed as follows. This I brought into attention because this came out this week too. Now this is important because I want to elucidate how long the influenza vaccines have been around and how we're still discovering all of the potential ways they operate. So let us read through real fast. Our years of studying antibody responses against the flu in the Wilson lab at the University of Chicago researchers kept, kept coming up with a strange finding. Antibodies that seemed to bind not only to the flu virus, but to every virus the lab could throw at them. Since antibodies are usually highly specific to individual pathogens, in order to maximize their targeted protective response, this pattern was extremely unusual. Until finally they realized the antibodies weren't responding to the viruses, but rather to something in the biological material in which the viruses had been grown. In every case, the virus had been propagated in chicken eggs, more specifically in part of the egg called the Alantos, uh, I don't know, please forgive me if I mispronounced that. Alantos, we'll check that in a second. All right, so to proceed. Now we're finding that these antibodies bind to this glycan, a sugar molecule found in eggs, which means that people who are getting vaccinated, you ready, are producing an antibody response against this egg component that's not related to the virus at all. So how long have influenza viruses, uh, vaccines have been around? Influenza viruses. How long have influenza vaccines have been around? Again, the, put the pieces together. The fact that vaccines grown in eggs can lead to this off-target antibody response is unexpected, but the implications aren't yet known. I love the honesty. It could mean that the immune system diverts resources away from developing protective antiviral antibodies to produce these egg sugar antibodies instead, which could have implications for vaccine effectiveness. Now, for the epidemiologists out there, often, you know, besides them missing the target influenza virus almost every single year. Uh, now you, you start throwing a question, maybe this is part of the reason why the vaccines have not been that effective every single year, outside of just missing the target uh, strains. Quote, quote, it doesn't seem to be harmful, but it may not be beneficial, and it may be affecting immunity. And of course, that's an important next step. It took the team years to determine that the antibodies were linked, not to the viruses they were studying, but rather to the eggs in which they were grown. No joke. We spent years thinking about this. More researchers needed to determine what, if anything, these anti-egg antibodies mean for the effectiveness of the flu vaccine. We don't know how these antibodies impact our flu-specific response. There may be competition between B cells against the flu and these egg glycans, which could be impacting immunity. And if there's an association between egg antibodies and reduced immunity, 
we need to look at alternative methods for flu vaccine production. Anything that can improve vaccine production is something that we should be considering seriously. What a wonderful, honest, beautifully written, uh, humble way of looking at basically discoveries. They spent years. So again, when we're looking at the vaccines of today, the mRNA vaccines, they've only been out a few months. So that is really, really, uh, how I would describe it, awe. You know, as far as you put you in awe, in reference to basically how much there is still to learn. So when individuals say a vaccine is 100% this or 100% that or whatever it is, and they speak in absolutes, a little bit too early in the game. So especially when you have researchers which are still doing a wonderful job asking questions and still trying to get answers to those questions. Wonderful research, great way of looking at it. Again, uh, influenza vaccines have been around for a long period of time. And now today, as of July 1st, 2021, uh, this has recently been discovered. To proceed as follows, new technology detects greater variety of T cells that respond to coronaviruses. I have this one line in here because it's important. The technology revealed that killer T cells capable of recognizing epitopes conserved across all coronaviruses are much more abundant in COVID-19 patients with mild diseases disease, versus those with more severe illness. I brought that up that because that is confounding because we normally were being instructed, well, not instructed, that's a well bad way of putting it, uh, informed that severe illness was yielding uh, greater antibody, uh, greater immunity as time went on. When ironically, it may be mild disease uh, that is producing a better uh, killer T cell effect. And there's another article that came out that may have some confirmation in reference to this one from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Actually, they play into each other. So here we go. Study with healthcare workers supports that immunity to SARS COV-2 is long lasting. Nice, this is not the article, it's actually the one after this, but here we go. Uh, one year after infection by SARS-CoV-2, most people maintain anti-spike antibody, antibodies regardless of the severity of their symptoms, according to a study with healthcare workers. The, result obtained, the results obtained until now lead us to believe that immunity to SARS-CoV-2 will last longer than we originally thought. No significant decay in antibody levels were observed over the first five months. At nine months, 92.4% of the people remained seropositive. 90% of them had IgG, 76, da, 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 recognized as a spike protein or the receptor binding domain. The results were similar among healthcare workers who had not been vaccinated in April. So this is real important because to vaccinate individuals that have already been exposed or had illness of SARS-CoV-2 is really a really big, big question mark. Did I emphasize that enough? Really, 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 really big, big, big question mark. Because remember last week we found out, you know, there's only one shot out of a two shot dose that basically elicited the same response. But now we're finding out uh, it's pretty similar to those that have been already vaccinated, the ones that were not vaccinated, as long as they already were exposed to the ailment. So again, uh, big, 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 big question mark. Now to the next one. Guess what helps fight or helps develop a resistance to SARS-CoV-2? And it's been brought up before, and now it's getting greater confirmation, the common cold. Let us proceed. This then for this article here, the study published online on July 1st, Science of Immunology, showed that killer T cells, man, we're talking again. Remember, in the beginning, it was all about the antibodies. Now we're going to the T cells. Killer T cells taken from the sickest COVID-19 patients uh, exhibit fewer signs of having had previous run-ins with a common cold causing virus, coronaviruses. So the interesting aspect of it, the less sick you were from the common cold or less run-ins you had with the common cold, the more susceptible you were because they're both coronaviruses, are, you know, obviously, uh, to having a severe reaction to SARS-CoV-2. So proceed as follows. 
The researchers analyzed blood samples taken from healthy donors before the COVID-19 pandemic began, meaning they never encountered SARS-CoV-2, although many presumably have been exposed to common cold causing coronavirus strains. The scientists determined the number of T cells targeting each peptide represented in the panel. Remember again, we paid a lot of attention to antibodies prior, now we're going to killer T cells. They found that unexposed individuals killer T cells targeting SARS-CoV-2 peptide that were shared with other coronaviruses, common cold, were more likely to have proliferated than killer T cells targeting peptides found only on SARS-CoV-2. All right. The T cells targeting those shared peptide sequences had probably previously encountered one or another gentler, common cold, coronavirus strain and had proliferated in response. Again, common cold. Many of these killer T cells were in memory mode, quoting the researcher. The Tesla hypothesis, Davis and his colleagues, turned to blood samples from COVID-19 patients. They found that sure enough, COVID-19 patients with milder symptoms tended to have lots of killer T memory cells directed at peptides of SARS-CoV-2 shared with other coronavirus strains. Sicker patients, expanded killer T cell counts were mainly among those T cells typically targeting peptides unique to SARS-CoV-2 i.e. vaccination. And uh, that's publisher bias. Sorry, but you, you get the point. And thus probably had started from scratch in their response to the virus. Quote, it may be that patients with severe COVID-19 had not or hadn't been infected at least nor recently by the gentler coronavirus strains, i.e. You, know, you got it. So they didn't retain effective memory killer T cells. Davis noted that Cold-causing seasonal coronavirus strains are rampant among children who rarely develop serious, severe COVID-19, even though they're just as likely to get infected as adults are. So to reiterate, they noted that the cold-causing seasonal coronavirus strains are rampant among children who rarely develop severe COVID-19, even though they're just as likely to get infected as adults are. We won't say it's causative, we'll just call it a correlation. Sniffles and sneezes typify the daycare setting. And coronaviruses caused by common colds are a big part of the reason. As many as 80% of the kids in the United States get exposed within the first couple of years of life. Obviously, with pandemic lockdowns, mitigations, masks, sanitation, so on and so forth, the irony here is this dynamic being uh, being reported here in the research as possible correlation in reference to the outcome of, of, of serious illness in reference to SARS-CoV-2, if that was a long enough run on sentence, um, may change. Because what do we do with the kids? We put them in isolation and uh, mask them up and then sanitize them and left them in the house. So you get the dynamic that we're basically uh, altering the immune system by reducing exposure to gentler strains of coronavirus may in effect uh, create a, a worse outcome potential in ex reference to exposure to SARS-CoV-2 due to that uh, pandemic mitigation measure. All right, next to liquid chalk. Melbourne researchers have found that liquid chalk, commonly used in gyms to improve grip, acts as an antiseptic against highly infectious human viruses, completely killing both SARS-CoV-2 and the influenza A viruses. All right, the reason for the research that is being utilized in reference to liquid chalk uh, is because the new competitions coming up in reference to the Olympics and so on and so forth, which the researcher alluded to. But Let's look at a few of the nice outcomes in reference to the gym chalk itself. Number one, as we scroll down, not detected, not detected, not detected, not detected. Uh, these chalk one, chalk two, chalk three, and chalk four, yeah, a little bit of detection. And of course, we have no chalk right up here, which is our controls. So you see what's happened there. Chalk, ba boom. No chalk, well, there it goes. Now, the, the chemical composition of the chalks utilized. And again, I'm not promoting chalk for any particular reason, but however though, in 
the gym setting, think about it. I mean, if, if gym chalk works well, then let's say, for example, someone has a public gym. Let's say it's not even an Olympic competition. Then the encouragement of the use of gym chalk uh, could be quite advantageous in reference to uh, disease mitigation or viral vector mitigation or viral vector mitigation. What do you want to call it? But here's the couple's, uh, ah, please forgive me, it's 1.56 a.m. And again, did I say happy 4th of July? Happy 4th of July. All right, here we go. Now we look at the compositions right here. And I'll have the links there for you too at the same time so you can check out the links. And there it is. I think the ethanol one didn't work as well as the other ones, but if, you, if the weird part about it, you're thinking of chalk, uh, I would not normally think of alcohol, and we know how effective alcohol is as far as is, uh, is a disinfectant is. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't think of that, but that's what it is. Now, this is liquid chalk, liquid chalk, reiterate. So I'll have the link for you as ref in the reference to that as well. All right, let's begin with the data analytics, and I'll move through it really fast. Ba -ba -ba. All right, let's go through the vaccine charts as follows. I am just going to report uh, again, for those not familiar, to the fact checkers. Uh, these are the data files we're utilizing. We're using the data files as of some update as far as July 2nd. And, uh, but however, though, I think the database was actually was, doo -doo -doo -doo. if we run through it here, again, please forgive me. Uh, yeah, July 2nd was the update, but June 25th, 2021 is the last update of the VARES database that we have on file. So let us begin. There's review and the information. Thrombocytopenia reaction by ages. All right. So here we are. We're looking basically right along this line. And for frequency stands for people. So for example, if you see this, just looking at maybe a total of four plus four, like eight people under the age of 20. This is, for example, this is the average age that basically people are coming down with the uh, thrombocytopenia reaction and reporting the thrombocytopenia reaction. Uh, and of course, it goes all the way up to here. If that's scientific enough, it's a symptom text that we're running through the, no, sorry. Now this is paralysis. So that's thrombocytopenia. This is a small bit of the data frame from the uh, people suffering from paralysis. 302 cases, if you see the rows there, uh, you'll be able to see this when it actually uh, prints, totally prints, when it actually processes total the 4K. And uh, Guillaume Barre, not Gouldian Barr, Guillaume Barre, uh, is not popping up yet, ironically, in the symptom text for the uh, epidemiologists and biostatisticians out there. But however, if you put paralysis in there, you will find more, uh, you'll be able to hunt down the Guillaume Barre reactions. Uh, going through this database, the VARES database is really tough to go through uh, unless you break it down like I am. All right, this is the age per year, da 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 da. da. Paralysis by age, 302 cases so far out of out of a lot of vaccines, but still just the same. Uh, these are adverse event reports. They have to be validated as being uh, caused or some sort of strong correlation in reference to the vaccine. Average age seems about 60. Myocarditis, look at this. The jump is incredible. 1,000, well, sorry, sorry, take care, 1,000, 102 when we broke it down. These are outliers here. 1,102 cases when we take the length of the actual the new database it did there. This database was from, yeah, same one, should be at the same one. 1,102 1, cases. This is the, obviously, if the frequency is people. And so there is the average age. Uh, now that is. I mean, if you look at the average age, for example, of paralysis, and we look at the average age of thrombocytopenia, and then this pops up, we're going outside the norm. That, that's worthy of note. That's what I think the CDC is really worried about because that is really just occurring for whatever reason. And obviously, if you see the curve here, 20 years old, 40 years old, 60, 80, in younger individuals pretty significantly. Uh, outside the norm, I believe, in reference to the ages, uh, maybe not outside the numerical, but in the age group, uh, that's that's pretty significant. Uh, let's go down real fast. 
uh, I'm going to come back up to there. Only reason being, I want to show you how we looked at also thrombosis, clotting. 1,417 cases, a little younger. But yeah, blood clotting is beginning to form as well. If you type in blood clot, it's not going to pop up. Uh, in fact, if I show you, for example, if we take the data frame and we look for blood clot right here, let's see if make sure nothing blocks. It's all capital, so I made it easier to search. Instead of to go and ignore case sensitive for the fact checkers. So I break that down like that. And if you type in blood clot, you're not going to get a tremendous amount of um, responses. So you've got to keep that in mind. But if you type in, for example, thrombosis, it's obviously a lot different. And of course, now it's taking its time printing out. So let's go back down to this and see exactly how many come out in reference to the blood clot. And of course, we're froze for a second, but we'll be able to piece this together. But if you get an idea here, that's how many come out with blood clot. See what I mean? There is not a lot. In fact, if you look at the total length, let's just break this down here real fast. The total length, whoops, break that. Let's put a little spot in there. Nine. So if you type in blood clot, you only going to get nine. But however, though, if you type in... So if you go to thrombosis, I was being lazy hitting control Z. And we do it this way. And we just take out this real fast. And so we go here. You're looking at let's just let's just change this thing right here. Let's say 10. And let's put the 70 again. And so you're looking at do do do. 1,417. So it's how you do your queries that are going to make a huge difference in reference to what, what you find and what you don't find. And ah, that's going to have to spice this together. But let's get right into the vaccine information as follows. Let's go to the top. All right. And let's go back to print information. Merging the data frames. Vaccine reaction reports by vaccine, it's actually not that. It should have been the 25th. Was that? That was correct, right? Yeah, so that should pop up that way. And so that will give you more of a, you know, it's more, well, that just being more technical as far as changing the date. And so 397,441. And this is vaccines by reaction. Begin to see a little bit of other vaccines in there, but still, this is your vaccine event report reactions. Uh, by age, you see right there, and that's the number of vaccine reports, and that's the age. Deaths. All right, COVID vaccine deaths report by age. So that's what we're looking at right there is 5,020. And yes, these are real. Uh, Adverse event reports, they have to be, they have to be basically validated. Uh, for example, if you look here and we go into the AJ-19, uh, you're going to find some pretty heartbreaking uh, event reports. That's all I want to say. I mean, heart failure, uh, you know, remember we went to the first part, we looked at rubel uh, rubella vaccine in reference to depression. Uh, you know, we have to look at things along those lines because it seems to be popping up quite a bit. Uh, you know, the heartbreaking. And if anybody comes up to you and say, well, vaccines are 100% safe, I, you know, I really think they should take the time to read the adverse event reports and, um, and recognize the fact that, you know, there's an A blood clot 18. Uh, there it needs to be a greater reference in reference to what is actually being reported, uh, because it's 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 basically it's disturbing. Uh, vaccine reports by age, rolling seven day, da da da. That's where it came down before three hundred ninety-seven thousand four hundred forty-one adverse event reports so far. Scrolling down the list. All right, so word cloud. Remember, word clouds are designed to see the most common words being utilized in the adverse event reports. 
And there is our word cloud as follows. Let's just make this a little smaller. Let's get it up there. Where we go? There it is. All right, there you can see the entire word cloud. That is probably the most common word uh, symptoms being reported uh, as far as language is concerned. And then the top reported symptoms uh, as you see right there. Now this is overall, this is all ages. Now we go to minors, it's gonna change quite dramatically. Uh, this one, for example, uh, that's the deaths. We're looking at that now. Obviously death, among death. But the weird part about the, the death part, and I wanna investigate a little bit more, is COVID-19, and these are individuals that are vaccinated. Uh, I want to know exactly how that is playing out. Uh, whether they're vaccinated, they already had it. Uh, but you're going to find a lot of uh, elements to that as reference to COVID-19. So I want to see if that's the, the doctors just diagnosing, whether they're diagnosing that as, as part of it or not part of it. But we have to look at that. Uh, but that's the port, that's the individuals that of you know, pulse absent, uh, that have, uh, basically reported uh, a, a mortal reaction in reference to the vaccine. And that was 5,000 of them. Now, COVID vaccine reactions were the minors. All right, there we are there. This is the days of the week. I just wanted to carry this as, for example, that's up to June 25th. All right, and then we go down, lot number reports as far as what lot numbers are experiencing the most adverse reactions. Um, you know, that's, the, that's the, the lot as follows. Now, again, not knowing the number of vaccines administered in that lot, that could create a lot of bias. All right, this is, da, 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 is really small. We'll come down to a second. These are people suffering from the reactions. Again, Janssen is just hitting them hard. It appears, at least as far as the adverse event reaction reports, if you see that all the way down the line, I know this may be a little small to read uh, for 4K, but this is their word cloud. Now look at the word cloud. Now keep in mind, chest pain. Chest pain is an unusually high uh, report in reference to minors. Look at it right here. Uh, it's down number four. And so you have headache, dizziness, fatigue, and then chest pain. And that's just cause for pause. Let's put it that way. All right, and you'll see a lot of that. Now, that's obviously I should be able to take that as one of the stop words. But however, though, C-reactive protein increased. That could be from other inflammation or whatever it comes down to be. But you see what I mean? That just, it's just weird to have that as number four. All right, let's go down the line. And I think, uh, remember the hypothesis I had in the beginning? What I wanted to determine, the reason I did this chart as far as the date time, is because I wanted to see basically as you begin to go further and further down the line of vaccines administered, people are gonna be less, we're probably gonna have people which are less and less likely to have wanted to be vaccinated. And I wanted to see if that gave a cause to a higher rise in reports. Uh, so what's happened there is basically the red line is reports. You have less people being, less vaccines being administered. And now you have a higher level of reports. So you, here you'd expect to see this higher, but you don't you see the exact opposite. So I was curious about the biases in reference to adverse event report reactions. So you could take from that what you want, but yeah, the less vaccines to be administered now and the adverse event reports are even higher. All right, uh, reports by age, da 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 uh, and we looked at the thrombosis, and that's where the, the computer thing froze, because I had this number out here, which had took this number here and put it way, 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 way far away from the chart, and it caused the system to freeze. Not for a second. All right, let's go into the other data as follows: mutations. 
All right, and what we're looking here is for primary viral, not mutation, sorry, red queen. We're looking for viral pathogen replacements. So let's go to the top here real fast. See if we see any information that's kind of unusual. All right, here we are. Uh, this is basically our, do, 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 that's, we're looking at mortality. As we see certain variants begin to rise, this is just correlation. Uh, mortality has seemed to decline. So even if you have B16172 skyrocketing as a predominant strain, uh, the data doesn't support the uh, hyperbole that is being propagated by certain uh, sources. Uh, vaccine to variant. This is where we're looking at viral pathogen replacement. Look at this just immediately correlating trend line then obviously it broke loose. Uh, now we're looking at USA, of course. The positivity rate uh, continues to decline. Uh, indifferent to the uh, variant. India, 1612, rising. Vaccination smooth per million. Again, they're like, you see the vaccines here, but they, only about 1% of the population is vaccinated. We'll review that in a second. Uh, mortality to variant. You can see why they were concerned about 16172 because of that. And that's obviously would give rise to concern. But however, though, um, positivity rate to variants tells a different story, doesn't it? Uh, so basically, the mortality could be from individuals that have been hospitalized for a while. It could be a lot of the confounding factors. But the positivity rate to variant tells a real different story. All right, let's go down. Da, da, da. England. Again, pretty much innocuous, but I wanted to bring that to attention because they keep on threatening the population with further pandemic mitigation lockdown measures. Uh, positive rate, positivity rate, seems to be indifferent in reference to the strains. Uh, remember how they did Arkansas in the beginning? How they said, oh, 200% increase, but yet it's like still like, so you go from two to four people. All right, yeah. And so it's 100% increase, but you know, still. Uh, new death smooth per million. That's as, as an example, not an accurate number. Uh, seems to be indifferent to reference to the, the strains. That's England, Israel. I know they went to masking and everything else like that, but they were the, the reason I wanted to bring it up because they're the most heavily vaccinated country initially in the beginning. And uh, that's the one I want to look for more than anything else, viral pathogen replacement. Uh, but there's that, the strains. Seems to be uh, nothing there. Um, this is the vaccine variant. I don't know, you tell me. Uh, correlations, uh, it's too early to tell, for example, uh, as far as what is correlated with what, like for example, 0.77 to the strain. So it's not probably the best judge, but however, though, the same thing with correlations in India, but I just want to keep an eye on it. If anything popped up, that's interesting. Vax variant ratios, the US, if you want to freeze that, that's perfectly fine, just to get an idea. And you can see how they go up and down. Now check this out. There's India. Now this is as of January 21st. So it's like, again, with this, you think they'd have as many strains, but I don't know why, but however, though, they're only measuring a few strains. Where like the United States, you have like one, two, which could the, which the early one, three, four, five. You have five strains and in India you have three. And then you go back down to here, UK, three. And so you see this interesting little chart there. Again, we only look at 100% occupancy of the strains. So if you have, it's not necessarily the infection rate in the community, but the number of strains that are out there per se. Uh, variant ratio is Israel. That's like, whoa. Again, you make of that what you want. And it's an interesting thing right there, which you've not normally seen, C363. Uh, but there it is. There's correlations, correlations, da, da, da. Let's move real fast. And let's look at COVID world data. All right. <laughs> that was Sweden. Look at that. That's the new deaths. Uh, U no, sorry, that's new deaths USA. Sweden's already been down there. All right. Look at this. Uh, this is USA versus all of Asia. Uh, but that's India. Look at the, the drop. So we review down here. Let's say, for example, just we're trying to work on time here. Uh, world vaccines mortality percentages. It was going up, 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 up. And then it went, just dropped. But it seems to have this, you know, this thing. So we'll see. 
All right, da 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 da. Let's keep it going. There it is. New cases in Asia. Boom. Deaths just plummeted. Uh, new cases smooth. Uh, it's like weird. It's almost like it's it's like a like a bell curve. It's it's like almost too symmetrical. Uh, Africa is going up up up. But again, seventeen thousand five hundred. Here is seventeen thousand five hundred. No, it's one hundred fifty thousand. So seventeen thousand five hundred. Is right about here compared to the rest of Asia. So even though the the chart looks disconcerting, comparatively to the rest of the world, population wise and so on and so forth, it's not that high. Europe, uh, for example, like even cases smooth, seventeen thousand five hundred, a little plus that, and right here you're close to twenty thousand. So you get an idea. Uh, then North uh, North America, new cases smoothed, massive drop. So on and so forth, then line, and we are going to move real fast because, yeah, look at Asia. This is uh, new cases overall with a shared y-axis. You see Africa? You get an idea? And so that's just, that's it. Look at this. This is the deaths. Plummets dramatically. All right, so let's go back down to real fast. Let's go to India. I'm only going to do India here because only 1% of the population is vaccinated, but this gives you an idea on how often they'll correlate the drops reference to vaccine. But however, though, you take like a, a large control like India, which has been not vaccinated enough to make a significant difference, obviously. Uh, you see these natural ebb and flows. And this purple is the cases per million. Of course, we have other countries too, where it just seems to have this followed in the exact same pattern. All right. And so that just gives you an idea. And I think Let's call it a night for tonight. Uh, let's see our Monte Carlo, our Markov to Monte Carlo model. And if we look at this new cases per million, if we keep on following that by January 3rd, 2022, we're still on target uh, as far as mortality, still on target. So let's cover what we covered tonight, just to give an idea. Do, 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 do. We covered going backwards, liquid chalk. Interesting. Highly effective at killing SARS-CoV-2 issue influenza A viruses. Uh, not killing, should say making them non-infectious. Uh, study ties milder COVID-19 symptoms to prior run-ins with other coronaviruses, i.e. common cold. Again, the links will all be there. And healthcare workers, um, in, uh, resistance, will, well, I won't use the word immunity, but we'll just say resistance to SARS-CoV-2 lasts a lot longer than anticipated. Uh, weird aspect, uh, mild disease, they tend to have better, better key to, uh, kill a T cell um, activity than those with severe, which is interesting because that can play a role with here. So individuals that have been trying to avoid the common cold for a long period of time that have been successful, unfortunately left themselves more vulnerable. Again, I'm not making any recommendations to, uh, whoops, that's the other one, uh, to this uh, event. Uh, vaccines grown in eggs. Yep, it's been around for a long time, and what an, an incredibly amazing discovery. Uh, not even talking the negative or positive aspect, but the fact is, yeah, you the the body starts identifying the egg or this basically the substance from the egg as being something to develop an immune response to. And then we go, boom, blood clots. Again, something to keep an eye out. Uh, obviously, we looked at our charts right here and found quite a bit of um, thrombosis. Uh, case reports, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia together begin to arise. Myocarditis, again, uh, it's really beginning to, I don't want to say it in a negative way, but develop a lot of traction. Uh, and something to be kept uh, keep an eye out for because it's myocarditis for whatever reason. Uh, seems to really have uh, a solid propensity of incurring in uh, much younger individuals, as we see right there. And then, um, and that's about it. And of course, I wanted to show that because I had a question about that earlier. So again, gratitude, thank you. 
uh, gratitude most often for the researchers for basically continuing to look into what is going on and finding better ways to basically uh, work with any future uh, events per se uh, in a more productive and effective way and to scientists who are willing to uh, uh, produce research that may be more advantageous to the public than their careers, if that makes any sense. And again, as well, too, thank you to Outbreak.info, Veris, and basically Our World and Data. Uh, wonderful data sources in which it would be very difficult to, for any of us to have data unless it was for these, uh, uh, how would you say, data outlets. Again, gratitude. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you all once again next week. Ralph signing off, and I'll catch you all next time. See you then. Bye.